So I was asked to give a disease management update and I decided that we would focus on relatively new things or in some cases really new things. So, so we're gonna to touch on frog eye leaf spot and that is new to the state and it's important. Soybean cyst nematode and sudden death syndrome. There's some interesting updates in both cases and then white mold. And so we'll touch on the updates without going into a lot of detail, but I do wanna make sure that you know what these look like, uh, you know how important they are and then talk a little bit about management. And then there's some resources at the end. You know, Greg uh, has mentioned that, lot room for questions. So we're gonna hit the high points on each of these. So we'll start with frog eye leaf spot, which is probably the most important update we have this year. It had not been found in North Dakota before 2020, at least officially, and I'd never seen it before, neither had Berlin Nelson. So if it was found before, it would have been pretty rare and pretty sparse. And that was not the case this year, it, it was all over. It's caused by a fungal pathogen and it's a leaf disease. So really this is the first leaf disease that can cause yield loss we have on soybeans in this state. And yield loss in a reasonable way. You know, we don't see a lot from bacteria or septoria. It likes hot and humid conditions, which is part of the reason we had it this year. And it is residue borne and seed borne. And so one of the questions we're not entirely sure of is how well it will overwinter. We think this will overwinter at least some, but we don't know how much. And um, just to give you a context of the yield loss it does cause in hot and humid environments, it's about $100 million in 2019 was lost in the North Central states, so the I states, and the Mid South, so Kentucky, Tennessee, Missouri. So we're walking around the fields late in August and we started to see these spots. And he's got kind of a gray center. Uh, you can see a little bit of grayness in the middle and then kind of a dark purplish brownish ring on the outside and it was fairly common. So we've had spots in soybeans before but this was different. So if you flip over this leaf you can clearly see some grayness and we were looking at by this this photo was taken by a shelter belt so it's pretty humid and when you have humid conditions and you've got frog eye it starts to sporulate. So in this close-up image you can see this gray sporulation and that is a dead ringer for frog eye. So that is frog eye. There's a couple other things that can be confused with. Neither are very common in North Dakota, but if you see this gray mycelium fuzzy growth and you probably need a hand lens for it, you've got frog eye. So we saw this at the end of the season, end of August, and my grad students and research specialists pretty much dropped everything to do a survey. We, we started the survey about two days before that freeze we had and maybe, maybe September 8th or 9th. And so they went through the Southeast part of the state and up into Grand Forks County to try to figure out how common frog eye was. So these are the counties that we were able to survey in that two day time period. The first number is the number of fields we found that had frog eye. And the second number is the number of fields we surveyed. So if you look at Stutzman County, five of the five fields had frog eye. And just a quick glance at this, most of the Southeast had frog eye. And as you went North, it pretty dropped off pretty quick. However, we didn't survey the whole state. We didn't have time before the freeze. So I'm coloring these in kind of light yellow. There's no reason to believe that this area did not have frog eye as well. They're just based on what we surveyed. We don't have data for it, but I would suggest that in this area, you might be on the lookout for frog eye this year. Okay, so that's only half the story that makes this a little bit interesting. So this is a this is an article I clipped from Emily Unglesby. She's a staff reporter for DTN. Uh, she's pretty well known, especially in the I states for the work that she does. And you can, if you can read that first line, the question that she leads off the article with is how common is fungicide resistant frog eye leaf spot? And the next line is so common that susceptible strains of the pathogen are now extremely hard to find. So this has been becoming resistant to the strobilurin fungicides, the QOIs or frac 11s, for some time. And Carl Bradley, in the next line, he's, he's essentially the US authority on this. He's quoted as saying, it's almost like they're going extinct, meaning that this, this pathogen is adapting so widely, it's hard to find strains that, um, that a, a headline or a quadris can manage. So we took advantage of Carl's expertise and he actually lived in North Dakota for a while. He was my predecessor before I moved. And we sent over 300 samples down to Carl from the locations that we surveyed. And unfortunately, about 25% of the samples we sent were resistant already to strobilar and fungicides. And so that, that's an issue. So how you'd look at this map here is those circles are approximately the locations that we sampled. 
The percent in green are the ones where Strobel learns still work to manage it, but the ones in yellow are where the resistance is already occurring. And so I think the take home message here is about a quarter of the isolates we found are resistant to Strobel learns and they're occurring everywhere. You know, there's some yellow in every county. So if we get this, if it shows up, if it becomes a problem, this is something really important to be aware of. Okay, so what do we do about it if that happens? So I would preface this by saying that we don't really know if this is gonna cause yield loss in North Dakota. I think it, first of all, it has to overwinter well, and then it's gonna to have to be hot and humid for it to cause problems. But if it does, we might be looking at applications here. So we don't have any local data. This is brand new. And some of the best data comes from Kentucky with Carl Bradley. So he's been conducting trials for quite some time and he's been evaluating uh, products and the, the general timing R3 is most effective to manage frog eye. That's been consistent through the eye state. So on his trials, he's, he's sharing with me some data slides. And so this is uh, three years worth of work, seven, seven location years, so really good solid data. He's got on this axis, the frog eye leaf spot severity. So severity, 35% severity is really pretty high. Yield loss is definitely occurring with that. He's got a non-treated here. And then across the bottom, you can see the different, pro different products tested. Now, the first thing I would look at is headline here. Headline can be very effective to manage this unless the pathogen is resistant, which it is. And so it's essentially the same as the non-treated control. And the letters of significance are here. But I do want to point your eyes to these other groups of chemistries. And of course, a lot of these products are mixtures, but the DMIs, the MBC, so FRAC1, the toxins, and then the SDHI, so things that uh, like in Endura is part of that. So there's a lot of chemistries and mixtures of chemistries that still work to knock frog eye leaf spot down. So if we do have it, the thing we do want to be careful of is the struggle learns. And as you might imagine, you know, this is a yield loss issue. And so this is the yield data in the same order that we showed the disease severity. The non-treated is about 35 bushels. And as you go across the list, it gets up easily into the 50s. So, you know, they're looking at 30 to 40% yield loss and these products are protecting the growers at that R3 application down there. So that's the first update I would share with you. The next is soybean cyst nematode. And just make sure we're all on the same page. It's a parasitic worm, it's invasive and it continues to spread. It's soil borne, so it's moving every way the soil moves and it can cause disease on every soil type, although it likes lighter soil, it likes high pH. Um, and it is the number one yield loss causing pathogen in the US and it's overcoming genetic resistance. So many of you have heard me talk about this before. Uh, just for a visual, you can see a nodule on the lower left corner, that kind of pink healthy looking nodule. And all those white ones are SCN, they're the SCN cysts. So we found this about 20 years ago. And when you see, and this is a shot from 20 years ago, this is Dr. Berlin Nelson in the field. And this is kind of classic SCN symptoms. You might see it show up in August, just as general yellowing of the plants. And to really identify it, you got to get in there, take a shovel, look at roots, soil sample. You just can't visually identify it unless you're in the soil. Okay, so there's a couple issues we have here. The, the first is that this thing continues to spread. And so this animated file, starts in 1954, and then it goes all the way through, you know, after, so shortly after it was introduced into North Dakota in the early teens. And there's nothing that we've been able to do to stop the spread. It just, once it's moving in soil, it's gonna move with on equipment, water, wind, it's just gonna continue to move. So the updated map was just uh, released in a press release two weeks ago, and all the counties in blue are new since 2017. And you can see quite a lot in New York and Ontario, you know, the leading edge to the east. And of course, we unfortunately are the leading edge to the west. So there's a zoom into that area and you can see four different counties or rural municipalities, I believe they're called in, in Manitoba also have SCN, but clearly it's spreading west and it's spreading north and east of Minnesota. So the North Dakota Soybean Council supports a sampling program. And this has been operating since 2013 and it's grower based. So I strongly encourage you to go to your county extension office, grab a pre-marked bag, take a sample and send it into the lab. And the North Dakota Soybean Council with a checkoff funding covers the cost of the lab fees. So it's a really great program. 
So this is the updated map since between 2013 and 2020. There's about 4,400 data points in here. And how you'd read this is you've got these black circles. So the black circles are negative. You pull the sample, no SEN eggs, you're in the clear. The boxes, those gray colored boxes, they're what I would consider inconclusive. So some will be real and some will not. And it's just simply because the egg levels are so low and there's other nematodes laying eggs in the soil. So I would just call them inconclusive. But any of the colors are real, starting with the low, the low levels, those green triangles, and going up all the way into those red pentagons, which are 20,000 or plus. And, I, and just for context, you know, about 10,000 plus is the old University of Minnesota recommendations that would suggest you're going to take yield loss on even the best resistant soybean variety you've got. So this is this is kind of a problem. So you've got a lot of expansion west. You're starting to see these green triangles and some of these blue circles pop up north and west. You've got some areas of the state where we're pretty suspicious there's SCN going on, but there's very few samples. So I would encourage you to take a look and sample that. Another point I would mention is that SCN can also infect dry edible beans. And there's a lot of dry beans growing in the northeast part of the state. So that's important. So we put together a heat map based on all this data. We've got enough data for the southeast and the east central part of the state that we can put a decent map together. And I would just share this with you that we've got a lot of SCM damage. We've got a lot of SCM potential. And so this has to be something we, we manage because this will cause probably 30% yield loss before you see above ground symptoms. It can be pretty devastating. Okay, a little bit more information on SCM comes from the SCN Coalition. And this is a public-private partnership of universities and companies and soybean checkoff organizations that have come together to try to unify the messaging on what's happening here with SCN. And SCN is slowly overcoming the genetic resistance, which is a big problem in the I states, and it's an increasing problem in our region. So I would encourage all of you to go to the scncoalition.com and watch some videos from this Let's Talk Toad program. So there's 23 different videos we've filmed. They're all two to three minutes, and each one of them talks about one specific part or component of SCN and SCN management. They were filmed from North Dakota down to Arkansas, and they're, they're professionally produced, they're really quite good. So the link will be at the end of this talk as well, but I would encourage you to go and take a look at those. There's a lot of really good information here. Okay, switching to sudden death syndrome. So this was first found in North Dakota in 2018, and it's in Otter Tail County, Minnesota too, if you're looking at it from the other side of the river. And this is a soil borne pathogen that also continues to expand and it is intimately linked with SCN. So as SCN expands, you might expect sudden death to show up later. And this is what's happened in our area. A couple of interesting things about it is it's a root pathogen that causes a disease in the roots, but a toxin goes up to the plant. We'll talk about that a little bit. Likes wet springs, frequent rains, warm temperature, and it is a yield loss problem, especially in the I states. Okay, so here's a picture from Richland County. Uh, this was 2020. This is sudden death damage with SCN in it. So the two together can be pretty devastating. When you see sudden death, you'll see it in the leaves first. So you see this chlorotic spotting between the veins that eventually will become necrotic. So at the time I was taking this picture, those chlorotic spots had started to become necrotic in the middle. And eventually that will expand in the leaf. And you get this funny pattern in the leaf where the veins will still be green, they'll have little yellow long halos, and then everything between the veins will become necrotic. Another symptom of sudden death is that you'll have all these petioles on the plant and the leaves will drop. So you can see I'm in this field here, this is late August, and they, there's just petioles everywhere. The plants look stripped of leaves, but the petioles are still attached. And it's really common with sudden death syndrome. And the last thing I would mention about sudden death when you're looking for it is take a look at the lower part of the stem or even into the taproot. And what you're gonna find is some browning along the edges where it would normally be white on the edges, it's just shave off a little of the epidermis. And if it's browning, that's common with the sudden death syndrome pathogen. If you see a symptom where the pith, the very center is brown and everything else is white, that's brown stem rot. So that looks a little different. I mentioned we found in 2018 in North Dakota, the first time, we didn't see it in 2019, but in 2020, we found it in Cavalier County. And 
that's a huge jump. That, that's, you know, it's a 250 mile jump. We haven't seen it in any other county, but now we've got it in Cavalier. So I would suggest that every place between Richland and Cavalier, it's time to look for it. Most of you, probably 99% of you don't have it yet, but if you find it, you gotta, you gotta manage it. And I'm gonna overlay the counties here where we found SCN. So when the two of them come together, the, the chances of yield loss are much higher. And you, to manage sudden death, one of the very first things you wanna do is manage SCN. So I would suggest that the Eastern third of the state should be considered at risk or at least scout for it. Like I said, most of you won't have it, uh, but we're gonna have surprises in 2021. I can almost guarantee it. One thing about sampling or one thing about confirmation of this is that the pathogen only lives in the roots. So even though we see leaf tissue damage, we see the petioles there with the leaves off, the pathogen never goes into that. What it does is it sits in that root tissue, doesn't move, but it produces a plant toxin and the toxin goes up, indicated by this red arrow here. So the toxin's going up into the plant and it's killing the plant, but the pathogen's only in the roots. So if you're trying to identify if you've got sudden death and you wanna send in a sample, I encourage you to do that but we need the root part, not the rest of the plant. So that's the most critical thing. Even the lower stem doesn't have the pathogen. It has to be in that root area. So just quickly about management, I would suggest look for it. Um, we talk about resistance, but I don't know if our varieties have it because it's a very new thing. Some might, but it probably wasn't intentionally bred. Rotation can be important, but it's not perfect. And there are two C treatments that are efficacious, Elevo and Saltrol. So for those of you that know you have it, this might be a wise investment. So we don't have much local data on this, obviously it's a pretty new thing. So I'm sharing a multi-state product evaluation that was conducted in 2015 and 2016 from Iowa to Ontario. So there's a lot of states, a lot, like a couple of years of this. And we're looking at the products and the severity index is on the left. So the bigger the bar, the more disease. And then we've got multiple C treatment and foliar products. And of this study, only one made a difference and it was a label. And I'm not gonna share the data with you, but Saltrol was labeled later, so it wasn't available at this time. In Saltrol and Olivo are really the two that have any management efficacy that we've seen. Okay, last update. This is white mold. So I'm not gonna get into the details on how white mold works other than to say it's common in all broadleaf crops and weeds are sensitive to this and it's the same pathogen. It doesn't, it's, there's no races, it's the same pathogen. It needs cool wet weather before and at bloom. And we do know in soybeans that there's a range of susceptibility among varieties. So there are varieties that are better than others. But fungicides can be useful, especially when it's cool and wet. And there's some really good updates that Michael Bunch has provided from Carrington. And he's been working on white mold for quite a few years. So I'm just gonna share a couple summary slides with you and then encourage you to go to that website and get some information. So the first is about timing. So he's done a lot of studies trying to optimize timing. And this is what he's come up with. So in the bowl here, fungicides should be applied as soon as 100% of the plants reach the R2 growth stage unless the canopy closes earlier, okay? So 100% of the plants are two, that's the optimal time unless the canopy closes earlier. If the canopy is closed at mid to late R1, so 60 to 85% of the plants, fungicide should go down right then. And if the canopy is closed at early R2, fungicide, fungicide should go down right then. So the idea here is, is that you probably want to wait till R2 unless that canopy starts to close earlier and then you want to hit it if you're going to spray. The second part of that update in some ways is to me a little bit more interesting and that's about nozzle size. And so nozzles, the most effective nozzle is going to change depending on canopy closure. And so I know there's a lot going on here. So I'm going to try to guide your eyes. So the first thing is this is T-Jet experiments. Okay, so this is all T-Jet. This bar here with the number zero to 15, that's yield gain. So the dots and these little blue hashes, that's yield gain by applying a fungicide. So these are the independent dots, but the blue is the average, okay? And then across the top, you've got canopy closure here. So this is canopy closure at, I don't know if I can see it, about 75 to 80%, 80 to 90, 90 to, 90 to 98, and 98 to 100%. So these are all canopy closure uh, groups, 
Okay. So when the canopy is about 75% closed, fine droplets, medium droplets, of course, they're, it's kind of a wash, but the tilt would be towards fine droplets. As it closes a little more, medium droplets. As the canopy gets to this 90 to 98% closure, the most effective control and highest yield gain was coarse droplets. And then between 98 and 100% closure, it was easily coarse droplets. And you can see a 10 bushel yield gain using coarse droplets. So with the T-Jet work, it looks like find a medium droplets when the canopy is not closed, but as it begins to close, you wanna get, you're gonna get more bang for your buck with coarse droplets. So changing nozzle. The next part of that is he did the same study with Wilger. And the very first thing I would say is that Wilger and T-Jet, what's a fine droplet, what's a very coarse droplet, are not necessarily the same between the two companies. And I don't pretend to understand that. I just, I just know that that's occurring. So similar experiment, so yield gain here, the bars are the average yield gain. And then you can see like basically pre-canopy closure here on the left, and you can see closure 95 to 100% on the right. What you're seeing is the most effective droplet size is coarse with the Wilcher before closure and at or near closure, it becomes very coarse. And so you take a look at both these things and think about it, you know, as the canopy starts to close, you probably need larger droplets to actually penetrate into the canopy. Whereas if the canopy is not closed, that fine, the medium, or in this case using Wilger, the coarse droplets, so a little bit smaller droplets are adequate and give you better coverage because you have more surface area of that droplet, more area for the droplet to hit. Okay, I'm going to try to summarize that again. So T-Jets, before the canopy is closed, or as the canopy begins to close, you want to, you want to use coarser and coarser droplets. Same thing with Wilcher, except you might switch from coarse to very coarse. Okay, that's all the updates I have for you. And the North Dakota Soybean Council, the United Soybean Board, North Central Soybean Research Program have all been instrumental in funding everything that I've talked about today. There's a few resources here. The Crop Protection Network has a lot of information on a lot of different soybean diseases. It's a multi-state, multi-university group that's put it together. The SCN Coalition I mentioned with the videos, the Let's Talk Toad Tour. And then the bottom link is the link to Michael Bunch's plant pathology page at the Carrington site where you can see the data I just showed you about white mold plus a lot of other things. Mm -hmm.